Hi, I'm David Canary. For six years, the Ponderosa was home to me when I played Candy, the foreman on the Cartwright Ranch. In 1959, America was introduced to two things that changed the viewing habits of tens of millions of people across the country. The first was the advent of color television. The second was a program called Bonanza. One wouldn't have existed without the other. Well, I think the early days of Bonanza, it's a known fact that NBC wanted to show in color. Uh, RCA wanted to show in color, I should say. And uh, NBC was the, was the only show on NBC that was in color. And we spent hours lighting every scene. We had 15, 16 electricians every day to make sure the color balance was correct. We had people all at the network that used to take all kinds of pains in getting the right quality going out on the air. And I think the first two years, uh, it stayed on the air solely because of the color quality that they had. Oh, I, I never knew a couple dozen sheep could be so hungry. Almost as bad as people. <laughs> hey, what are you looking at now? Hey, that's what I call a right pretty girl. Hey, look over here. That fellow right there, that's that handsome Joe Cartwright. This guy's always watching me when I'm shaving. I just can't seem to get rid of him. I was the first writer to become a television producer. The show was a little show called The Restless Gun with an actor named John Payne. And uh, Michael had been in the pilot. Look what just rode into town. While I was doing that, I got the idea for Bonanza. I called Michael, he came in, and, um, and there he was, you know, the first time I really had met him in the flesh. He was a most attractive young man. We got a little game. We like to play with strangers that come into town. Oh? Yeah. You see, you and me draw on each other. And the man that draws the fastest gets to shoot a cartridge off the other man's head at 50 paces. That sounds a mite dangerous. Oh, you mean you don't want to play? Do you know when we do that shot where the four of... We used a title shot at one point where the four of us rode up at a full gallop and pulled up right in front of camera with... Uh, a smile, kind of like this. <laughs> Little macho type of head. Right. And that smile meant, oh. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Haven't you ever seen a lady before? No, ma'am. I mean, not such a pretty one. Not in a long time. You know, girls say they like poetry and music. But the men that really impress them are those of strength. Of courage. I'm going to take this gun, and I'm going to walk through that barricade, and I'm going to walk down that street up to that mesa, and I'm going to kill as many of Matthew's men as I can before they kill me. Of physical action. Little Joe, the way Mike played him, was the hot-blooded little brother of the Cartwright clan. He was the one who most often got the girl. Now, I can't speak real fancy like Shakespeare. And I don't agree with it. Why not? Well, first of all, I can't compare you to a summer's day. You're more like a day in spring. I could talk real fancy, and I could say that your eyes are like stars. And I could say that your mouth is like a rose. When I look at you, I just can't think of anything to say. Am I beautiful? You're very beautiful. Can we talk of love sometime? Oh, Joe, if you really want me. I want you. I want you more than anything else in the world. Tell me again, Joe. Say it again. I love you. I love you more than anything else in the world. Tirza, you can't go. 
to understand I love you more than anything in my life. Of course, I'm, uh, I'm not exactly Romeo. chance to learn that lesson. You just leave that stand there. See, that's a very important beer glass. That beer glass is you. This one's me. See, now the idea is to see if you can spill my beer before I spill yours. Anytime you're ready, loudmouth. died of a real bad case of slow. Would you turn away from me, Cartwright? You killed my pa! I'm sorry. In our first season, 9 o'clock, we were number one. And that is not only because of color, but because of the excellence of the cast. And uh, we remained number one, I think, for five or six years in a row. And throughout our entire 14 years, including the first two years, uh, we were never out of the first five places. And we were number one, I think, more than any other show in the history of television. Joseph, <laughs> you do me a birthday favor? Why well, you just name it, Bob. I'd like to hear one of my favorite songs, Shenandoah. Well, here goes. Oh, Shenandoah, I long to hear you away, you rolling river. Oh, Shenandoah, I long to hear you away. this show, the Japanese version of Bonanza? Have you ever seen oh, an extra color? It's incredible. It is hysterical. Dan Blocker would get off a horse. Dan weighed, what, 260 pounds? 320 when And he'd come in and get off of the horse and the Japanese and the horse would go, ah. <laughs> 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 then there's big Dan Blocky in here. <laughs> it was hysterical. All the dubbed in Japanese. <laughs> yeah. mm. They had Hop Sang go, Hop Sang in the show would go, hello. <laughs> <laughs> While most actors in television series were negotiating for higher fees and bigger trailers, and star billing. Michael Landon was one of the first to ask for something else. He wanted to direct. For 
morning, boys. Beautiful morning. Well, you're awful quiet this morning. I figured you'd be happy to see me. You're insane, Postley. You know that, don't you? You're insane, and you're trying to drive us insane. But it won't work. <laughs> you know, I feel sorry for you, John. You're down there, and I'm up here. And you, you feel, feel sorry good. for me. Yeah. I'm free to go any place I want to. No, you're not. You can't get away from here. You got to keep coming back day after day, week after week. You're just as much a prisoner as we are. You'll never be free. There was a scene that um, I was delighted to, that he wrote for me, in, in which Candy finally becomes unhinged in his prison, and um, James Whitmore, the heavy, tosses down dynamite. Mike devoted his time and talents to writing. And as Ken said, he worked with John Hawkins, who was uh, a great teacher, and Mike was a quick learner. I started out by saying that Mike was a brat. And after directing him in 63 Bonanzas, and then working for him as a director for 68 Middle Houses and 22 Father Murphys, I found that one of the best, finest friends I'd ever had, the most talented people. My great delight and surprise was at his naturalness, his ease, his understanding of so many aspects of things, and his great capacity not to let his own celebrity get in the way of what he was trying to do. You know, that's not always possible with a lot of people, but I, I thought The Wish was a strong piece. I thought it was ahead of its time. I thought it said quite a lot for Hollywood for its day. Jesse, you get that wagon to start loading. Beth, you help him. Papa, is that our home? We can't leave. Jesse, you load that wagon, boy. You want them to know they scared you off? You want them to know they scared you off? Go thinking you know how I feel unless you're black too. I love this farm. But I love my children more. I can plant corn again and make it grow. I can plant beans and make them grow. But I can't make my children grow again if they're dead. And that's why we're moving out of here. understand you're being scared, but there comes a time when a man's got to fight. And they ain't gonna hurt them kids, I promise you that. I ain't gonna let them, I promise you I won't let them. Thank you, boss. Thank you for taking care of old Sam and his children. Oh, Sam, I didn't mean it like that. No, no, you're right, boss. Go ahead and take care of old Sam. Show his boys how the big white man always takes care of Papa, so that when they grow up, they won't forget that it's the white man who is the man. 
I think it's easy to understand how Michael might have looked upon The Wish as an episode that satisfied him more deeply, perhaps, than all the others that he had done. There was one very special relationship between Dan Blocker and Michael, which mirrored the brother relationship they portrayed on the screen. It's very considerate of you to drive me, Mr. Cartwright. Well, most people hereabouts just call me Little Joe. Little Joe? Well, you're not that small. Oh, it's not that bad. It's my brother horse is that big. <laughs> Joe, this whole wagon is getting mighty heavy. <laughs> you gotta suffer a little bit to be champion. <sighs> <sighs> You sure we're going about this the right way, Joe? Oh, I'm positive. Please, let me do the thinking. All right, 25. How about it now? Come on! Oh, that's it. That's it. Very good. good. All right, let it down easy. Easy. Oh, oh I told you to be careful. You know I got a bad back. No, look, are you letting your heart rule your pocketbook? Hmm? Well, Joe, money ain't everything, Dad. Burn it. All right. Look, I didn't know when I went and parted with you that you were going to go squeamish on me. But let's not forget that I still have a little say. Half of these rabbits happen to be mine. And I am going to skin my half of the rabbits. Now, if you'll just step aside. No, you ain't. You ain't skinning these rabbits, Joe. Oh, yes, I am. Would you step? You're standing in front. Fat Gerby right there behind your head happens to be my Gerby. You're standing in front of my Gerby. No, you ain't skinning these rabbits. Not today, you ain't, Joseph. I'm skinning that Gerby. Now, uh, I don't want to have to come through you. I'd, I'd reconsider that, little brother. Well, I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you, my brother, I'm fast. Now, that Ger there's a that Gerby right behind there is my rabbit. I'll cut you to rip ribbons. I won't. I'm gonna have to. I'm telling you, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do. That's my Gerby, and I'm gonna get to him. One way or the other, brother horse, I'm gonna get into one of these cages. Well, come on now, let me out of here! I'm, oh, wait, come on. Let me out of here! You! you run away. Oh, I won't. Pa sent me to bring you home to supper. Dad, burn it. Dad, burn your on me. Hide, little brother. Wait till I get my hand. got to be the bone. You're bigger than I am. You ready? Okay. Hey, bully. Hey, bully. Hey, bully. Hey, bully. Hey, bully. Hey, bully. Hey, hey, bully. hey horse. When Dan passed away, Michael wrote a tribute episode called Forever. It's so beautiful. That's my favorite place. Brother Hoss and I used to come here when we were kids. We didn't do anything special, we just... sit and look at it. It's a 
call it a happy place. to run out that door a hundred times. In later years, I moved to this house. I no longer ran out the door, for childhood had given way to young adulthood, and I had a child of my own. But I'll never forget that first house. It was like a real home to me, not make-believe. And Michael Landon was more than just my boss. He was like my father. Streets of Walnut Grove are covered with mustard meat. It's hard now to see where the buildings once stood, but for me, the memories are still very clear. That was the mercantile, the church, Belly's restaurant, the ice house, and the road that led up to the mill. Mr. Hanson, and how they walked and looked and talked. Another step. Oh. It was the best day ever, wasn't it, Bart? Oh, that it was, Bart. I'll always remember it, won't you? I'll always remember it. I love you more than anything. I love you. And that it was okay to let things out. I have to. Don't you even care about your own brother? Pa cares enough for all of us. But that's all he cares about anymore. I don't pray for him to get well, and he dies. And um, I blame myself. And I climb a mountain looking for God to ask him to take me and give Pa back his son, and that at the end of the episode where he's, he and Victor have climbed the mountain looking for me, and they find me, and Ernie Borgnine says, go to him, child, go to him. Natural and, and so real, and I remember feeling really loved. It was well, the, the two shows where I went blind, and I remember thinking the, the season before, I think it was at the rap party, the season before, and I actually was a nervous wreck, and I went up to him thinking that you're writing me out. Why are you doing this to me? You know, and and he said, "It'll be great, Missy. This is going to be great. You know, trust me." This plague, and uh, I was about nine or ten, and I played a dying girl. Uh, I had plague, and uh, my dad uh, played the part of Mr. Ingalls, and he came in to talk to me. Um, and I was the neighbor child. And uh, I remember it was, um, it was very special because it was the first time I ever got to act. And I remember we had to do the scene over again because while my dad was saying his lines, he got more emotional than he wanted to, um, as if I was his daughter instead of the neighbor's child. And so we had to do it over again. Fine. I was out to see him this morning. They wanted to send you a whole mess of cornbread, but I told him it'd be a little while before you got your appetite back. Feed a cold, starve a fever, Ma says. Your Ma's right. I wonder if I'm gonna 
die. You're gonna be just fine. I'm not scared. I know I'll go to heaven, especially when you die in church. No more talk of dying, all right? Just get some sleep. All right. I remember driving back in the car with him after the day's work and just feeling so proud. I think that was probably my most special memory of working with Dad.